Thank you, Rico. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. If you're not joining us live, welcome to this replay, and we appreciate your shares. If you enjoy the content you see here every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, feel free to share that. Um, we appreciate your shares. And as just as well as we enjoy bringing you this educational hour every Sunday morning. And happy Easter, everybody. Welcome. What do you think, Rico? We're here today with my co-host, my usual co-host, Rico. Um, I also have Quincy here with me, next to me. Good morning, Carol. Good morning, Dee Dee. Good morning, everybody, and happy Easter. Um, so if you're joining me live this morning, that means you're not in church. <laughs> Good morning, Bobby. Good morning, Adrian. Uh, hey, Amy. Welcome, everybody. I'm losing my co-host. So today we're going to be talking about a couple of different things. Um, I'm going to be talking about animal behavior change with the season. Good morning, Coco. Um, hey, Julie. Hey, Sean. Hey, Ashley, Felicia, Sonia. Welcome, everybody. Happy Easter. And hey, Crystal, happy Easter to you. Happy Easter and happy April Fools, I suppose. I was thinking this morning in the shower, I was getting ready. I was like, what kind of joke can I pull as an April Fools? And I decided against it because everything I came up with, I was like, no, people are going to run with that and all kinds of rumors. I was going to say, um, we have a giraffe in the center for training. <laughs> Which I have. I seriously thought about that. <laughs> morning, Storm. Morning, Carrie. Morning, Debbie. Hey, Karen. Happy Easter, everybody. Um, for those that don't know me or are new to Coffee with the Critters, what do you think, Rico? You want to take it away? You take it away? If I ask him to do a somersault, there's going to be an audible explosion here. You can do somersaults? Go ahead. I know you're wanting to. It's like he knows when I go live. Let's do it. You get to do your somersault? Ready? One, two. Oh, you're going to put your wings on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Shaping the behavior of him doing his somersault. Wow! Nice! Yeah! Woo! What do you think, Rock? <laughs> Told you, it'll last about a minute. Good morning, everybody. If you're, woo! If you're joy Say morning, happy Easter. Welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. Good morning, Dawn. Good morning, Cheryl. Good morning, Tim. Hey, Lee. Mia! And the awesome Nancy Forrest is on here, and Patricia Anderson, Jeannie. Yay, hey, everybody. What, who told you that? <laughs> Got my love bug back out here with me. Peekaboo yourself. <laughs> So welcome everybody to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. If you are new, thanks for joining us. We go live every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern. Um, we are an international, my name's Laura Joseph, sorry, by the way. Um, sometimes I forget to say certain things. Yeah. My name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center teaching people through our online services, live streaming services about living, loving, Learning with animals using applied behavior analysis and 
positive reinforcement. Touch. Hey, Quince. Touch. Good. Because <laughs> it's a lot. I like using positive reinforcement and applied behavior analysis, not only because it builds strong working relationships with the animal, but um, as I age, it's just a lot easier. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. What? Okay. Tell everybody. Can you tell them? And she's like, nope, out of here. All right. Thanks. Thanks. So welcome to another episode, episode everybody. Um, today we are going to discuss, um, what are we discussing? Hi, animal behavior change with the season. So happy spring. Um, as the seasons change, especially here at the Animal Behavior Center, and with a lot of the animals that I work with, um, I do work with domestic, but I, I love working with exotic animals because the uh, message is very strong. Meaning, message very strong, meaning um, you can use force, coercion, um, aversives, punishment-based methods, with animals, um, does it work? Sure it does, whatever work means. Um, it does or it wouldn't exist, but it doesn't exist without their consequences. And I like showing work with exotics because you may be able to force um, an animal, let's take a domestic animal for example, um, you may be able to force them to do something, but you do that with education turkey vulture, baboons that I was working with the other day, um, what else, porcupine that I was working with the other day. <clears throat> um, <laughs> your, your results are probably going to be very evident very quick because you may be able to force them to do something once. Um, and here we have a lot of animals up in rafters, in water, um, what have you running on land that we need them to do what we need them to do when we ask them to do it. And notice that I said ask and not force. Uh, one word you will never hear me use in my verbal repertoire is the word command because there is no command in positive reinforcement training. Um, a command is a, force, a form of coercion, meaning do it or else. Here, we request or we cue animals to do something. Do we use force? We don't rely on it. Once in a while, we do have to take the animal's um, choice out of the matter. Very few and far between. I would say less than 5% of what we do. Uh, but it's usually, um, we, we'll train for that. Like we train animals to be to accept restraint, um, and for the most part, everything is to be less stressful. So let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. See, Karen said there's somebody on here from Sweden. Yes, so um, let me go ahead and get started. We're going to start with um, some... I, I like doing the recap of the week with the volunteers. We have interns here our students here from Lord's College, their psychology division, because applied behavior analysis is a branch of psychology, um, but it focuses on using environmental events to control behavior and um, changing behavior through observation and measurable data. And what I do here at the Animal Behavior Center, touch, good, is um, I make that very easy to put in common everyday terms. So. Um, I want to share some of the things we've been doing here throughout the week with the different students and the different volunteers here because <laughs> you can see that behavior change happening during the week. And I want to show you some behavior changes happened this year or this year, this week from last week. Um, so I am going to start with it's taking my name off of here. Let's see, let's bring us back onto the broadcast. I'm gonna start with, real quick, I just wanna say we just announced this morning our next Cocktails in Canvas. We have very few events here for the public um, where our doors are open to the public. We do this maybe once, maybe twice a year. And um, the 
ba the awesome Bonnie Zimmerman, director of the Indonesian Parrot Project, will be coming to stay with me for the weekend, the second weekend in May. And we decided last minute to have a cocktails and canvas fundraiser here for um, the Indonesian Parrot Project. So yeah, we'll be getting the, the picture up that we're all going to be painting um, at our next cocktails and canvas fundraiser. And what I'm thinking about doing is we sell seats here where people come into the center, but I'm thinking about finding a way to do this via a live stream as well to be able to include more people. Um, and with that being said, I've got the awesome honor and opportunity to be interviewing on a future Coffee with the Critters, Amanda Kelly. Um, she's a board certified behavior analyst, very well known in the area of applied behavior analysis. Um, she has the No Straws for Me campaign going on. We're gonna be talking about applications in applied behavior analysis, um, animal welfare, welfare, and her No Straws for Me campaign. So you can join us on Sunday, May 20th. We're gonna be doing that one at three o'clock in the afternoon because she's from Hawaii. So we're gonna make um, use of that time change. Yay. So, okay, uh, some recap. Here's um, our volunteer, Amanda, teaching Jordan, one of the students from Lord's College, the importance of enrichment and how we use enrichment in every behavior change program that we have. Um, and we do. Um, we're working on some pretty tough cases um, this week, one happening at the zoo, and um, enrichment is one of the it's the first thing I go to, and enrichment via training and via foraging. Okay, so last week you saw, remember me talking about, here's two more of the students from Lord's College. This is Chuck on the left and Amada on the right. Last week when they first came here, um, Rocky flew away from them. So we put a behavior, out of fear, we put a behavior change program into place and we ended up splitting them up. We had Amada working at the front for food prep and Chuck working at the back um, as to not uh, overstimulate or push Rocky past his comfort level or his threshold. This is a picture I took yesterday. Uh, hi, Chuck and Amada. <laughs> We're back here at the Animal Behavior Center and look where Rocky is, right next to him. So that is a behavior that we shaped and we shape that um, small reinforcers, reinforcement through small approximations. Thanks, Quincy, for making the job so much easier. You want to vote? But we shape that um, through verbal reinforcement. So every single time Rocky would say something, not only would Chuck reinforce it by repeating, um, he would reinforce that behavior by turning around and looking at Rocky. So uh, verbal interaction, eye contact is a positive, re well, it was, how do you define a positive reinforcer? Um, the animal will let you know, um, because if not, you'll punish that behavior pretty quickly. And tone of voice. So um, I was at the zoo again this week, and here's an updated picture of a Pocahontas, which I'll start training her as soon as the weather gets a little warmer, and I'm going to see what she remembers of her targeting, um, stationing, um, foot targets, recall, what have you. And yes, <laughs> imagine that. I fell in love with another uh, umbrella cockatoo and um, great teacher, another great teacher. We worked, I worked with some baboons this week and taught them um, stationing, targeting, and um, what else did we work on? Recall. Oh, and we also worked on, um, so these baboons like to steal things, so I started working on teaching them to give it back to me on cue. So if any of you have watched the work that I had done with uh, Micaiah, the pigtailed macaque, she, um, he is a resource guarder, and we worked with um, 
teaching him to clean his own enclosure and hand items of high value back to me. So that's fun. Um, Rocky went to the vet again this week for a nail trim. Yes, we could easily trim, train him to allow us to trim his nails, but <laughs> he enjoys the vet visit, so we take him in, and it's, it's a good time for all, especially the people. Hi, Rico. Here is, um, and this is, this is something I want to talk to, talk about as well with, um, with the seasonal changes and the changes in the season. A lot of times our animals are housed indoors um, throughout the winter. And that can cause, we're going to talk about this too with pigs, that can tend to cause, t pigs can be labeled as territorial, very easy. So um, this room is the room that Milo sleeps in, stays in. I don't want to sp say spends most of his time in. He spends most of his time sleeping in there. But his waking time, we are shifting him throughout different areas to keep him used to change. Um, and here, like... Milo will charge and lunge at people if he's not used to them being in their environment. So we need to keep him used to change. And we have uh, about 10, no, eight students maybe from Lord's College in here now. Those are new people. Those are changing people. So here is Amada. Um, here is Amada working with off contact with Milo um, with a nose target. So here uh, he's learning that every time he touches his nose to that target stick, Amada will bridge immediately. So right there she's bridging. And then Milo will turn and look at her for positive reinforcement, which is food reinforcement. Now I do want to say with pigs and a lot of other animals, you want to start to switch up your reinforcers from just food um, that's a little harder with your non-social animals but definitely there don't rely just on food for positive reinforcement so what we're going to start working on with Amada and um, some of the different volunteers here next week is starting to include physical contact as a positive reinforcer and like I said it's always the animal that determines the positive reinforcer never us so I am paying attention to your comments so if you have anything relative please feel free to share it and if I can touch on it I will if you want me to speaking of touch good um, so we are also and this is part of our topic today socializing keeping your animals socialized is so extremely important right now um, in our level one and level two membership program online membership program we are going to be getting we're going to begin starting to talk about separation anxiety that's going to take us several weeks to talk about um, separation anxiety a lot of times is unknowingly trained um, we do have some instances here with it, um, but the more you can keep your animal socialized, used to change, um, and that change in form of changing environments, going, their, their, their environment changing, um, taking them into different environments, keeping them socialized and used to other people, all the more the better for the animal the less you'll see separation anxiety and distress so a lot of times I tell people a lot of times people will say this animal prefers this person and not this person the hard part is not getting that to change because that that can happen that's the easy part the hard part is finding that balance once you get here I don't want to say hard it's one that takes more observation um, so socialization is a huge part of keeping animals used to change because you can get a lot of stress if if I'm the primary caretaker and I have to leave 
and that animal has separation anxiety, um, that can cause a lot of stress on the other keepers uh, and more so for that animal. <coughs> so let's go ahead and start getting tar talking about our topic, um, which is animal behavior change with the season. So it is April 1st and it, it has been raining quite a bit here. I take advantage of the changing seasons. Um, the winter, it's cold. A lot of times we can't get animals out. I just want to see. Um, we can't get animals out. So a lot of times those enclosures become stagnant. Uh, stagnant meaning if you don't keep the environment changing, keep their enrichment changing. Like I was saying yesterday, I was speaking with the zoo. I said enrichment is a huge part of um, all of our behavior modification plans because I need that animal focused on doing something else besides just interacting with me. Um, because studies show that if you're actually using positive reinforcement cha training, it's the animal's preferred form of enrichment. Um, so I take advantage of the winter. I take advantage of it being darker out longer because usually when it gets dark here, almost every animal settles with the sun. So that has, that gives me a chance to sit down and draw out plans for different areas that I'm going to design or use as enrichment. It gives me opportunities to design uh, more intense enrichment. It gives me opportunities to design and plan aviaries for additional aviaries for the birds. I have designed many, many aviaries. <laughs> and I was just talking to this zoo yesterday about the importance in aviaries and different enclosures to shift animals to. Even if throughout the winter you don't have the time, um, throughout the winter if you you can easily keep your animals used to change by shifting them from area to area. And I will talk to you about this. Um, okay, Pam Price just coming in saying she's late sneaking in the door. You thought you were sneaking in the door. I caught you. <laughs> so it's April 1st here. Um, it looks pretty sunny out, but this past week it's been a lot of rain. I take advantage of that rainy season um, because usually with the birds, they tend to get more mellow and they settle down. So those are the days that I take off out of here. And um, I can go pick up supplies, uh, design aviaries, uh, take the, an the mammals out in the center, work with them. This is the time to train your dogs um, over the whole winter. Train your dogs to walk loosely on a leash throughout the winter inside your house. Where I do not take my dogs to train them to walk loosely on a leash is at the park because you're usually dealing with over threshold, overstimulated. Once your animal is over threshold, meaning you no longer have control over that animal, um, you've lost your opportunity. It's not that you can't change that, but you've lost your opportunity to change that particular instance. And every time an undesired behavior happens, it gets stronger. As B.F. Skinner said, you must never reinforce an undesired behavior. And I say, <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> um, so this is the time that I work on a lot of focus and control exercises with the mammals, uh, <clears throat> with the zoo animals, uh, with birds here. And that's what I was going to show in this photo is and even though this is a bird, take, for instance, any animal you can do this with. It may just not be via flight. Um, Lee says, huh, some of my stuff is not showing up. I'm trying to show Lee's comment, which says, I could use your help designing an aviary. Yeah, well, let me know. Message me. Because those of you, Lee, I can't remember <clears throat> if you're a member of the Parrot Project, we have an upcoming webinar, which I 
for people that are members of the projects or the memberships, pending on the webinars, you get those at no charge. Um, we have one, which is one of my best-selling webinars, which is um, designing and creating indoor, outdoor aviaries. So that's coming up, I believe, in May. But anyways, okay, so back to the animals. Even though this is a bird, we're going to talk about several different animals. What I do during the cold months is this is me inside Suki's cage, Suki's enclosure, this past winter, and I'm practicing recall. I am training that recall. Come to me. Go on your perch. Come to me when called. Go back on your perch. Um, I shape those behaviors through the months that I may not be able to take them outside in aviaries. And I shape that now. Shape it now. Um, same thing with the dogs. I shape this behavior in the house. There's the bird flying away from me. What, Rock? <clears throat> shape those behaviors. What's that? Hi, Rocky. Shape those behaviors now before it comes time for the warmer weather. So once I move them into different aviaries, I'm going to take small approximations. Good boy, Rock. I'm going to take small approximations. So once it's time for that bird to go into the aviary, see here you see it in a 10,000 square foot enclosure. I am now, I've already been shaping that inside the enclosure. Hi, what? Now I can start shaping larger and larger environments. What you looking at? Something's going on out the center. Same thing with the dogs. And I have some dog photos coming up. Um, what do you think, Rock? So um, some different animals and some different behaviors. You guys hear me always talk, hi, Rocky. I always work on focus and control exercises. I do that on purpose. My training sessions are 15 seconds to a minute and a half. Um, it's all about the repetition, not the length. It's about the frequency, not the length of the training session. If you're going over three minutes, you're starting to push it. If you go over five minutes, I don't know. I could probably train a bird here for five minutes. What do you think? With an, go boy, Rock! with some intense training sessions, but I prefer to keep them shorter. Um, one thing I was talking about, when a lot of times when our animals are closed up in throughout the winter, I've got a Rottweiler here, um, they tend, if, if they're not getting out of enclosures, if they're not getting out of rooms, they can become what's labeled as territorial which uh, is also can be labeled as aggressive. With certain animals, especially in the spring, if their environment is not changing, it can reinforce other undesired behaviors such as uh, nesting or breeding. Hi, Rock. What you I know, I don't know what you just said. Hi. But we train for out like, now that the weather's starting to break, I want to go. Yeah! Woo! Woo! Audible explosion. I need a sign that goes like this. Oh, yeah! Woo! Woo! Nice job, Rock! Did you guys see that? Now? Nice job! Quince. Yeah. Yeah. Nice job. Give me two more. Hey, rock and roll. Rico, put your wings up. Let me see those wings. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, positive reinforcers I'm using to get the behaviors I want to maintain or increase. Um, eye contact. Attention, noise, rhythm, pitch. It's always the animal that decides the positive reinforcer, never us.
Okay, so I'm starting to train the dogs for their different outings. I need them to get out of here. We, a lot of times people don't have the luxury of space that we have, but it's not necessarily the space that's most important. It's what they have to do within that space. Um, let me see, you guys have been asking some questions. Lee says, if your training sessions go too long, they get easily distracted. Yes, they can. Um, and then that's when you start entering those different states of like what Deb Jones and I were talking about, classical conditioning, um, the emotional state of the animal during training. And that's when you hear me say, just what? Just because you're using positive reinforcement training doesn't necessarily mean it's a positive experience for the animal. So your training sessions start going too long. Negative reinforcement can stop, start creeping in. Negative reinforcement is um, you get the behavior that maintains or increases for the it, for the animal to escape, avoid the consequence. So I see a lot of people's intended positive reinforcement training sessions start to have negative re reinforcement creeping into there. <clears throat> negative reinforcement is coercion. You get that, you start poisoning the cue you start associating your training sessions with something, with an aversive, something the animal does not like. Um, just happening like I was paying close attention to making sure <laughs> talking to the funny thing uh, so Coco's particular scream reinforces the behavior of Quincy howling I was looking for an interruption I was gonna put something in there as an interrupter because Quincy's howling could then be reinforcing Coco screaming. So how do you change that? You have to manipulate the environment and take control of the one reinforcing the undesired behavior. Lee says, how do you, hi Rocky. I want to reinforce that tone of voice. What are you doing Rocky? How do you train your two not to fly after you when you feed him and the other birds. It's been a common thing. Um, <clears throat> well, if that behavior, Clinton, if that behavior is maintaining or increasing, it's being reinforced. A lot of times, what I'll do is redirect. The, I'll redirect attention to something else. That's why when we put when we end a training session, we try not to necessarily give. Um, an end of training session verbal cue. Hi, Rocky. What we do is re, re redirect attention because if you're using positive reinforcement and it's the animal's preferred form of enrichment, why would they want the training session to end? So, hi, Rocky. That's very cute. Oh. <laughs> it's sad. Rico wants to do her somersault, and I'm like, <clears throat> um, so a lot of times when we end a training session, we'll redirect attention to something else, to a forging toy or a different type of enrichment that they get at no other time. Um, that way, it um, helps prevent um, something that could be labeled as aggressive and Makaya, the pigtailed macaque, if you give him a cue and say, okay, we're all done now, you're going to see a primate starting to shake um, cage bars. That is an animal I did not want to work with uh, because I was very afraid of him. So if I'm afraid of an animal, I will put myself in a position where I'm not afraid because I need to be comfortable as well. Because if I'm not comfortable in delivering a positive reinforcer and I jerk my hand back like that, that could be enough of a cue to reinforce 
aggressive behavior on the other side of the cage bar. So that's why a lot of times I'll start my training off contact. Um, training is communication. Animals learn through reading your body language. Most of them do not understand the majority of what's coming out of your mouth. Most of them are paying attention to your body language. Hi. Um, Karen says, Quentin, you could teach them to station. Good, yes. Um, station means go to an area and don't move until cued to do us, cued to do otherwise. Um, so different things we do to train animals for focus and con or, or outings is focus and control exercises. So here is hi. Here's a focus and control exercise. This is Levi, our deaf bulldog in the background, and Snow. Snow, our deaf and Coco, our deaf and blind border collie in the front. What I am doing here is I have cued them both in a down position and now reinforcing duration, periods of time of staying. Why do I do this? This is, it causes the animals to really focus on you and pay attention to you to get prepared to take them for an outing. So, um, then I slowly add in distractions. Uh, so those are just, we do focus and control exercises here all the time. We're getting ready to start taking our animals on outings, all of them, minus the fish. Um, so some environments here, even as much as I preach it, environments here, sometimes it gets stagnant because I get busy. Um, that's why we have a team of, there's 10 of us. Um, and now with the Lord's College students, there's about 18 of us here, uh, seven days a week, minus today. I'm here all by myself today, and that's okay. I'm going to hang out party with my animals, celebrate Easter with my animals. Um, so here's another focus and control exercise that I'm doing with both of the dogs that just gets them to pay attention to what you're doing. So even training the cue to jump on the scale could just be the scale coming out. So what, I, what was happening is both dogs were trying to get on the scale. Um, and so I was like, well, what do you want them to do instead? There's different behaviors. So I'm teaching Quincy to station on the right in a down position while I'm creating duration and teaching Levi, our deaf bulldog, to station on the left on the scale. Um, here are the three of them. I'm training just focus, focus. And even though we've got Snow, our deaf and blind dog, on the right, she can focus. She's getting ready to go out on several outings with me hopefully within the next week, and hopefully I can take you with me. Um, I'll definitely be live streaming that in the memberships or projects and showing what complications we may be having in the next steps in training. Um, <clears throat> so here, this is Puzzles the Giraffe that I work with, and this is what I focus on with training with him throughout the winter. Keep him recalling back and forth between different enclosures, targeting, whatever. So as in getting him prepared for when he goes back outside, when the weather turns, this is uh, a target stick I had made for him. When it's time for him to go back out into his outdoor enclosure, I can now recall him with the target stick which is what I have right here. I just made him another one because he's getting ready to go outside in his outdoor enclosure. I will use this target stick for different animals as well. Um, that's what you see in that picture. And many times you have to shape the size of the object. The animal may not necessarily be, <laughs> Quincy's sitting here, can I touch the target already? <laughs> Um, we can do some exercises. This is called generalization because Quincy Quincy 
Quincy's like, yeah, 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 let's do something. Quincy has never targeted with this target stick. Um, I definitely don't need this long of a target stick with her. Maybe another animal that maybe um, shows signs of aggression. Do some target training. So targeting is getting an animal to touch a particular object on cue. Coo -coo. Good. So if I need to move her from point A to point B, I will use a target, especially if an animal doesn't like an enclosure. Good. Where I need to crate train. Who's been in the floor? So, a crate. Good. Say the bed is a scale. If I need to step on a scale. Makes sense. Targeting is one of the first things I teach any animal, uh, <clears throat> especially one that I may not be familiar with because it helps me in reading body language. Okay, I'm just going to pay attention to what you guys are saying here. Remember that for next year during... <laughs> okay. Um, snow is doing fabulous. We're going to be doing a lot of live streaming of snow in this upcoming week. Um, so I just wanted to focus on uh, Quincy for today. Each time I do a coffee with the, tri a coffee with the critters, I um, plan ahead which animals I'm going to use. So you can target train anything. Yeah, and I brought this one up for, oops, brought this one up for you guys for Easter. So... <laughs> We were thinking about finding some chickens or bunnies to train today for Easter, um, but I couldn't find a way to do that um, time effectively and healthfully for the animal. Hi! So <coughs> this is a picture of me target training a rabbit, and what I was doing was recalling that rabbit. We had him out in a large enclosure. I was re I'm trying to get Rico back on. I was recalling that rabbit, and then I trained that rabbit to stand on its back feet with a target. Yep. Um, see if I can do that with Quincy. Quincy, you want to be my rabbit? Okay, let me get some treats. I've never done this with her before, so I don't know what I'm going to get. Coco! Let's try this. Quincy, want to be my rabbit? I need a cameraman. Anybody want to volunteer to be my cameraman? Good. 
Good. I just want to see what you We're shaping this behavior with Rico back here. Nice yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we're reinforcing him. We're increasing the complexity in his somersaults. So I'm trying. What? He can do somersaults so easy, right? He's been doing it for years. But now we're trying to shape the behavior of him swinging upside down and flapping his wings. Do it. You can do it. So usually I, his cue is one, two, three. That's for a somersault. But I'm not necessarily wanting a somersault. It's up to him. I mean, his choice is still in it. Um, so Adrian says, can you guys see this when I put this up there? Adrian says, when the pups see the target now, they can't wait to be the first to touch it. Also using hand targets too, teaching weight so they don't go rushing through baits and doors. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I love target training. I love training, obviously. And hopefully you saw how short the session was. Um, that doesn't have to be very long. Um, so let's go ahead because we've got another 10 minutes. Um, but I want to talk about some different things that we can train for. Um, <clears throat> so, like I said, we will, we train for changing environments, outdoor enclosures, outdoor aviaries. This is one of several aviaries that I had designed for the parrots. Here's another one. Um, we can start shaping car rides with the dogs. We can start shaping going to the park. I was trying to look for the warmer weather. Um, I like animals here to be comfortable with um, water and bathing. Uh, we need that here for all of the animals. Um, we have to shape a lot of animals' um, interaction with water. Some of you that were in the snow project saw how I did that last year with snow. Our deaf and blind <coughs> puppy uh, we shaped that water. I saw she was curious, and um, I know you've got a question, Mano. I'm going to address it. I saw she was curious, and there's that article I wrote on use, how to use curiosity as a reinforcer because many times we can easily punish an animal's curiosity by taking too big, go, go, by taking too big of steps of introducing something new to them. So I saw that she was curious with water. A lot of you in the snow project saw how I shaped all that behavior to the point that now she cannot wait to get into the shower. She cannot wait to go into the pool. <coughs> she cannot wait to interact with the hose. We do that here with several different of the animals. So Mano says, so you throwing treats is your way of redirecting and ending a training session. Yes. So that way, and it's just something that it's not something anybody taught me. It's just something that I do based on using applied behavior analysis. Um, because just ending a training session, a lot of times those animals don't want that training session to end and it can cause some anxiety um, and maybe some undesired behaviors. So I redirect. Um, and then that allows me to close the enclosure and exit or walk away and by their time they're sitting there sniffing usually by the time they look up they don't even realize that a based on their body language they easily move on to something else uh, makes sense Mano uh, okay so I just want to make sure I turn that comment off Because for some reason, I cannot see when I'm putting on a comment. Um, so I believe it's no longer there. 
isn't it? But anyways, um, somebody said, okay, good, good. So yes, snow is here permanently. Um, another foster fail. So something else I want to show you. So this is how we introduced Rocky. Well, it's not how we introduced. This is Rocky taking a shower. We like him flapping those wings because if they flap those wings, they are expending energy and it is wearing them out and it gives them something else to do besides practice an undesired behavior. And a lot of times those undesired behaviors lead to abnormal repetitive behaviors. Um, the smarter the animal, the harder it is to keep. So something else I wanted to talk about, well, um, I'm going to start taking Milo on some outings, so we've got to get that harness back on him. He hasn't had a harness on all winter. Um, so I want to start pairing that harness, really small shaping exercises. Every time that harness goes on means we're training. So I'm creating a conditioned reinforcer. And that way, a conditioned reinforcer is a cue. Thanks, Nancy. Um, a conditioned reinforcer is a cue. And me just slapping a harness on Milo um, and leaving it on for a long period of time, that could be an aversive. So I need to shape, I need to shape those behaviors. Um, so we're going to start in the pig project. We talk about how to introduce them to a bath um, and keep them enjoying a bath because Milo needs to look presentable when I take them on an outing. Um, Something else we're doing here right now is we're doing shifting of a lot of animals. So what we do, the dogs need to stay a certain area, as say, um, or in a crate as the vulture comes out, as a pig is being moved into another room, as we move with the porcupine from one area to the next. So this is a photo of me teaching them to station in a certain area, stay someplace and don't move until cued to do otherwise. Here is, they're both on, you can see the X's up front towards the trash can. They're on their X's in the back. This is so I can safely move another animal with distance in between. What do you think, Rock? Um, oops. So one thing, you know, we can use. What? What are you thinking, Rock? We're encouraging a lot of enrich or a lot of exercise, a lot of play. Um, as animals are moved into outdoor enclosures, they don't have to be so focused on foraging toys as they were through the winter. <laughs> we do still use them. Um, pigs like the sun. You can move them to different areas. Milo likes to sunbathe on the deck. Um, and something else, let's end this by talking about behavior issues we get with animals so this one in particular i want to show i'll make it i'll make it up by itself so you can see this is willie the education turkey vulture here for training from nature's nursery she is biting i could easily say attacking the glove she is definitely biting it um this is a behavior i see usually this time of year um she's this is a migrating bird um her weight changes, her behavior changes. And I was looking for that nesting um, photo that I posted the other day. But tomorrow in level two, we're going to be talking about, um, we're going to be talking about um, seasonal changes with raptors and how I approach them. Because we are definitely having seasonal behavior concerns here with Willie, and I want to show how we address those. Um, we are going to address those with uh, an online uh, discussion with a Metro Park. Um, <clears throat> so some other issues. Oh, Eva says, how is Milo doing with his tusks? He's doing fabulous with his tusks. We are not trimming them um, because we don't want to very pretty rock so there's easily i need to get willie under control i need to control her i need to control her environment for her safety for the safety of the other animals and for the safety of myself and the volunteers here 
So here's me scale spraining her the other day. Um, and there's different approaches I use with her. And we're going to discuss a lot of those. So some of the other behavior issues we see with the changing of the season, separation anxiety. That's what we're getting ready to dive into in level one and level two. Hey, Rocky, what's that? Coco! Some other behavior concerns we see with the changing of the season, fear. Fear to new objects because of staying in stagnant environments. Hi, Rocky. I figured you'd be joining tomorrow, man. Desensitization, taking small steps in shaping calm behavior to a once feared object. Um, counter conditioning. A lot of times you have to do a lot of counter conditioning, which is retraining. If I don't have to counter, I try to prevent counter conditioning. Um, Deb Jones and I are going to be talking about that in our upcoming workshop that we will have in the second week in October here at the Animal Behavior Center. Um, and then another one, very common. I see this a lot with the companion parrot community. When I see a parrot doing something like that, um, that is nesting behavior, looking to crawl into drawers, under dark objects, what have you. Hi, Rocky. How what you doing? And a lot of times, people do not recognize nesting behavior. Um, I'm going to look and see if anybody has any questions. Um, yeah, so we intentionally do not modify body parts here. We just modify the behaviors. That's why I don't clip wings. Um, I'm not saying I'm against it, but I just don't do it. I'd rather focus on the behavior issue. Um, something else, like with the tusk, we're not trimming them. Um, we are training him to allow, and we're doing this in the pig project, to allow us to do a tusk inspection and clean them. So they're nice and pearly whites. Uh, do I give, hi Claire, are you the one that's been contacting me? Somebody, I've got like three uh, people contacting me this week for cats. Yes, I will give advice. Um, but if I don't feel, I mean, I work with any animal using applied behavior analysis. My focus is teaching people how to understand animal behavior through using applied behavior analysis. And that's what we do here. We do it with a wide, a wide variety of animals um, because some people learn through watching different animals. For example, our level two, our level two online membership um, is geared towards the professional animal trainer. Um, the zookeeper um, and the people wanting to get into this field or the people wanting to implement this more intensely at home. And our level one membership is geared more towards the companion animal community. Um, right now there, we're working in with a lot of dogs in level one, but definitely not limited to, but it is geared towards companion animal. Hi, Rocky. And all of this is through live streams, podcast, activity, paper reviews, networking, um, how do you handle certain situations. We also have species specific. Um, so in our level two, we'll work with a lot of zoos. So I use a lot of different, uh, I live stream with a lot of different zoo animals. So people learn how it works across the board. We have our services that are species specific, the parrot project, and we have the pig project. Um, so with that being said, it's coming up on 10 o'clock. And so, Claire, if you have any questions, just shoot me a message. Um, Allison says, my male Moluccan cockatoo has started plucking. Allison, we're getting ready to potentially dive deep into um, how to change um, mutilation within the parrot project. So that may be starting this week. So feel free to get in touch with me. But with that being said, um, Every Sunday morning, we do a live stream here on the animal be at the Animal Behavior Center. We do our coffee with the critters. Um, just to point out that we have our
myself back in there. Hey, um, if you guys need to get in touch with me, you can reach me at our on our website, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com, and you can always reach me via email. My email is Laura at the Animal Behavior Center .com, and I always answer each individual email. So, with that be being said, everybody, I hope you have a hi, Rock. I hope you have a happy Easter. I'm here by myself today, so I'm going to bring all the animals out, and we're going to be spending the day training and um, making enrichment. All right, feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Happy Easter to you, and I will see you next Sunday, if not before, in another live stream here this week. All right, take care.